co-host this morning, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here as always. Oh, the pleasure's mine, sir. No, it's all mine, Rob. All right, you win. You win. It's yours. <laughs> also, you gave me way too easy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's do. Let's do this. Give me a chance to uh, to back off. Right, let's welcome in the uh, admiral co-hosting uh, again this week. Good morning, Billy. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> let's move on to the badger, Michael Height, Delegate Height. How are you, sir? Good morning. It's great to be here this morning. How it's are you? Wonderful to be. I am awesome. Did you see my Dukes yesterday? Uh, uh yeah, no. Huh? Yeah. Oh, I did. <laughs> what about there. that? They were good. There were two great games yesterday, if you like upsets. Oakland beating Kentucky last night, and this kid making 10 three-pointers. Yeah, but let's let's not take the attention. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's go, go back, back to, the to the Dukes. Dukes. Go let's go back to the Dukes. Dukes. First, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Rob. First appearance <laughs> since 1977. First win since 1969. And, huh? and to add some sweetener to it, uh, prior to the tournament starting, BYU was getting a lot of love of going quite quite deep into the tournament. There he so. goes to another team again. Yes. Well, no, but no, no. <laughs> he did it again to me, didn't he? He, he just can't give just, me any. Nope, he can't give you anything. My friend John Partington, who I called games with for yeah. 20 years, 15 years, whatever it was, sends me a text this morning because Duquesne's next opponent is Illinois. He goes, Illinois looked pretty good last night. You're going to get blown out. I'm like, what kind of a friend is that? <laughs> Can I enjoy first time in 40s? Since I graduated from college in 1985, Duquesne has never been in an NCAA tournament. And we finally get in one. This has been so much fun. Then we win. And that's the text I get. You're going to get blown out next game. And, and Mike, Thanks, John. Mike, you can attest to this. You know, prior to this show, we all – we. Uh, give our issues for the day. Rob gave directions yesterday. All the issues have to be about, be about Duquesne. Yeah. That's the only thing yeah. we talk about. I want to hear breakdowns of Illinois' defense and how we're going to beat that. That's what uh, I need to know in this game so I can implement that because I have a lot of influence over the coach. Uh, all, all, all my questions and, and comments are going to be about Bobby Vinton and which were his greatest songs um, after he came out of Duquesne. Hey, you know what? Pride of Pittsburgh, baby. Yeah. Bobby V. Our first guest uh, knows a thing or two about sports because uh, he has done some play-by-play himself and still does. Michael S. Schultz, attorney law and a candidate for the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Michael, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Bill, for reminding me that that was one of my losses last night. I picked BYU over Duquesne. All right, get yeah. out. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a short campaign. Get him out of here. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't, I don't blame you. Yeah. You know, you, but uh, our head coach had said he was going to retire at the end of the tournament, no matter what happened. And I thought, you know what? That's a lot to play for. Yeah. A lot of emotion there. I think yeah. they can pull one out here. And that's actually what I love about the tournament. Those cool stories like that. First week is the best. I mean, the Duquesne coach. Think about Don Monson for mm-hmm. Long Beach State. Of course, they got blown out yesterday, but he was fired five days before the tournament started. Right. And they hired I mean, him back, didn't they? Well, they said he could stay okay, but... until they were eliminated from the NCAA <laughs> yeah. tournament. So How nice of them. Yeah. He sat down in his first press conference, and he said, well, I just want you to know, I'm doing this for free. That's my introduction, because I've been fired already. Any questions? <laughs> like, no, okay, we're good. I think if you've got a head coach working for free, you take it easy on the questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Basically, uh, volunteer yes. status. Uh, Michael, introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, that uh, Maybe they missed your phone interview with us about a month ago or so. Sure. Michael Schultz. I'm an attorney from Charleston, West Virginia, and I'm running for the Intermediate Court of Appeals, which most people don't know about. But this is a, a new court. Went live on July 1, 2022. The governor appointed three judges on staggered terms, two, four, and six years. There is one judge on the two-year term, Tom Scar, who is retiring. And so this is the very first time there has been a seat open for election. It's a statewide election on this court, and I am one of three people running for it. And only one of you can win. Only one of us can win. Right. Unless so, there's a tie, and I really don't want to go to that. because <laughs> That would be interesting. That would be very interesting. And you also do radio play-by-play TV. I do. I just finished my 15th year of doing the University of Charleston men's and women's basketball teams. And the University of Charleston actually had a magical run to the Sweet 16, lost at Gannon on a putback at the buzzer. They uh, led for 39 minutes and 59 seconds. Oh, wow. And they lost at the buzzer. Was the game at Gannon? It was at Gannon. How was the weather? <laughs> that's, that's eerie. That's Lake Erie right there. My good friend, Scott Abbott, who actually does a phenomenal sports photography, he was able to go to it. I was not. I had a court hearing, actually, on, on Wednesday morning. But he sent pictures of a lovely spring morning in Lake Erie. Yeah. And, I mean, it was 
what you would think. It was a snow squall looking out <laughs> over at Lake Erie, and it was it was awful. It was wow. horrible. Uh, so uh, your legal background has prepared you for this uh, opportunity to run for the ICA. Tell it, us about your legal background. It has. I have been practicing in West Virginia ever since I got out of law school for over 31 and a half years. I came here in 1992. So come August, it'll be 32 years of litigating literally all over the state. And when I say all over the state, I mean, I've been up here in Berkeley County, Jefferson County. I love coming to Morgan County, Berkeley Springs. I've litigated in the northern panhandle in Brook and in Hancock and in Ohio and Marshall County, in Morgantown, the middle of the states, every place south of 79, I've, I've, I'm sorry, uh, 64. Mm-hmm. Uh, last I checked, 37 out of 55 counties I have actually litigated a case in. And so it's that experience I bring to it. Plus, if you look at the four areas that the Intermediate Court of Appeals actually hears appeals from, I am familiar with or I pract- actively practice in all of those. Can you C- say those four? Sure. Civil litigation. It's about 30% of what the ICA does based on the latest statistics. 30% family law matters. About 25% workers' compensation appeals. And about 15% administrative appeals. And so that, the, that's what the court was set up to deal with. That's what the legislator said this court is going to hear. And in my 31 years, I've actually actively practiced in or in the case of workers compensation i've done what a lot of what's called deliberate intent which involves workers compensation issues so i'm the only candidate who can say that one over 31 years two all over the state and number three in all of the areas that the intermediate court deals with i have that experience you've also received recognition as being the best lawyer in certain categories would you Either you mention it, or I'll read them off the, uh, the web well, page. That's not like a threat, Bill. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. But he should be—he should be quite proud of this. He's uh, has a very I, illustrious background. I, I am, but I—I I will be honest with you. I hate talking about myself yeah, and my accomplishments yeah, yeah. because yeah. my approach to work is always collaborative, and so I've been blessed. First of all, I was blessed early in my career to have a great set of mentors who taught me what it meant to be a good lawyer, ethical lawyer, great trial lawyer. And I like to say that I stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. And, and then I've been blessed with to have good teams, associates, paralegals who work with me, administrative staff. So, I, I mean. Yeah, it, I, it's commendable not to want to talk about yourself. But I'm going to uh, read a couple of things off. As uh, uh, You weren't getting out of this at all. Like, <laughs> and, uh, the Defense Trial Council of West Virginia recognized you as the attorney, the attorney of the year. You're recognized in, uh, uh, as the best lawyer in 2021 and 2023 in litigation. Uh, you're uh, you're listing best lawyers in America. So there's quite a few things that you have been recognized as being, uh, as being quite impressive with. Thank you. And, I'm, and I am proud of those accomplishments, understanding that it, it's not just me. I'm just the tip of the certainly, iceberg. Certainly, yeah. And... and you know, have that recognition from your peers. And that's what, to me, is most special. This isn't some sort of popularity of vote, not because I have the biggest signs or the best radio commercial. These are your peers who vote for that and who, who have that recognition. So I'm, I'm humbled by it. Obviously, I'm pleased by it, but uh, I'm mostly humbled by it, Sorry. which is part of the reason I don't... I don't actually publicize that a lot. Understand but that has to be drawn out of me. But, but your peers know it. My peers know it, yeah. yes. Mr. Height. So I don't know a whole lot about the law. I'm obviously not a lawyer, but I would imagine that um, being a prosecutor is different than being a defense lawyer and being a judge is much different than either one of the two. So I guess my question is, why um, the ICA? Why, Why not at a lower judge level and then move up to the ICA or to, I'm, I'm actually surprised sometimes when I see lawyers who've never been a judge, you know, run for, um, intermediate court of appeals or, or even the, the Supreme court of West Virginia, um, rather than get their feet wet as a judge, because I would imagine being a judge is much different than being a, a prosecutor or a defense lawyer. You are absolutely correct. And there's actually a big difference between being a judge at the circuit court level or at a magistrate or family court level and being what's called an appellate judge, an appeal court judge. And the difference is this. In the appeal court, you don't have trials in front of you. You don't actually have parties or take testimony. You're dealing with a record from a lower court 
or from an administrative proceeding, and you take that record, the facts that are in that record, and you apply it to the law. To a certain extent, it's less emotional because you don't have parties testifying in front of you. You don't have trials. And the reason the ICA appeals to me, I'm going to call myself out, I'm a bit of a, a legal nerd or geek. I love to read and get into documents and dig down into complex issues and figure them out. And then I love to explain what's going on in very understandable terms. That's what I do right now as a trial lawyer. I have to explain to six people in a jury sometimes very complex issues. Well, how do I do that? I need to break it down into a very simple, understandable way. Rob, we talked about this last time I was on. It's kind of like what I do when I color commentate. I've got to explain what's on the court in very simple terms, break it down so it's understandable for the audience listening to me so that they can see that or they can understand that. That's what I do as a lawyer. And so ICA suits me best because that's where the appeals, that's where the hard cases will go. That's where the complex issues, somebody's unhappy with a decision down below, that's where they're going to go. That fits my temperament. More important, well, as importantly, I should say, not more importantly, this isn't a stepping stone for me. This is where I want to end my career. I don't want to go on to the Supreme Court. I don't want to use this to go on to the governor's. This is it. This is my dream job to end my legal career because I've been doing this for 31 years. And I can't think of a better way because I'm at the point in my career, in my life, I want to give back public service. I have two daughters, raised them here. The younger one just graduated from WVU in, in December. Should have sent her to Duquesne. Right now, you'd have a fun <laughs> experience in the NCAAs. Do you know, one time she was so proud that she knew that LeBron James played basketball, and she was so proud of herself. That's how deep her basketball knowledge goes. <laughs> let, now, so, let, let her know this nugget. LeBron's high school coach was Duquesne's yeah, head coach. Yeah. Correct. And he gave him some shoes gave to play. Yeah, shoes. A, a caseload of shoes for players to pick from. But and we digress. And, and one year, she actually picked the NCAA basket based upon the color and the design of the uniforms, what she liked best. Yeah. And she beat me that year. I've never asked yeah. her to play again. My niece did that to me when I was the sports director of another radio station, and she beat me by picking the cuter mask. Scott. Wow. And you were never, she was never invited back, right? <laughs> <laughs> she beat me every year doing that. I mean, there's, that's maybe the way we should all pick, I guess. I don't know. Uh, let's, let's talk about the, the nature of an appeals court yeah. versus um, uh, a, a circuit court in that uh, when a, co a court case comes to an appeals court, you're looking for something different than you would from the initial court. You are. As I mentioned, you have a record. Mm-hmm be a testimony, documents, one. Now, you already have the record, so there's no testimony in front of a, an appeals court. You take that record and you apply it against the law. Now, if it's a statutory or if it's a rule or it's a regulation, you have it in writing. You know what the law is. Apply it. If there is no written rule, regulation, or statute, then there is case law, precedent, if you will. That's the legal term. It's precedential. It's precedent. Apply it to what the Supreme Court has said the law is. And if neither of those, then you have to figure out, well, what would the legislature do? So does this require a, a, a staff of people working along with a judge to investigate these cases to find out if these uh, misinterpretations of the law have occurred? It does include a staff. You have the three judges. Those three judges each have, I believe, three law clerks that are assigned to them. And then there is also a pool of of law clerks. So when that something comes in, the judge not only reads the briefs and figure out, out what the issues, but the judge then has a team of individuals available to say, all right, go and research this, go and research this, go and pull this line of cases for me, go and see what other states have done, around us have done, because very often if there isn't a clear answer here, what West Virginia judges will, go, will do is, what did Maryland do? What did Pennsylvania do? What Ohio? What about Virginia? What about Kentucky? States around us, how have they handled this issue? So that's what the, the pool of clerks are available to do, but ultimately it's the judge that makes the call. Now, do you work by yourself or do you work with your two colleagues? Do you sit uh, independently in front of a uh, appeal? Ultimately, you're responsible for your own decision. But does it work like the Supreme Court, for example, that everybody listens to the or looks at the same uh, 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 same information? Yes, everybody looks at the same information. The, they have what are called conferences where the judges get together, the three judges of the ICA. 
I know this happens at the West Virginia Supreme mm -hmm. Court level as well. Mm -hmm. They get together, and they get together more than once generally on a case. And first one is a preliminary, I mean, how, are you, how are you viewing this? And it's a rough guesstimate, if you will, of who, what the majority position is going to be. Sometimes 5-0, sometimes a 3-2. So then the case, the written opinion is assigned to whoever is going to be in the majority. And that individual is responsible for, they call it a signed opinion. That individual is responsible for putting together and getting the majority's thoughts into a signed written product. And I think that's sometimes overlooked because there's nothing more disheartening for me as a lawyer than looking at a signed opinion and saying, what the heck did they mean by that? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the last thing you want. You want clarity, you want certainty yeah. on what the decision is so that everybody knows it because we all want to know what, what are the rules. Yeah. That's what the law, that's what the appellate courts do. A quick what if game, if you in front of, if in front of you find there's a procedural error or you find that there is a, uh, what you feel an error in decision, in the judgment, what should take place? Would the procedural error, error uh, take precedence? It, it depends on when the procedural error is made because if there is a procedural error that is before the substantive decision, then that procedural error may need to get corrected. Mm -hmm. And in that case, what appellate courts do, they call remand. They send it back with instructions to the circuit court or to the lower, lower tribunal and say, hey, this was the procedural error. This is what you need to do to fix it. Fix it. Very rarely will the appellate court fix a procedural error mm -hmm. because you want to give if there was a procedural error, you want to give not only judges, but parties a chance to fix that. You, you, the last thing, believe it or not, <laughs> last thing a lawyer wants is to win a case on a procedural <coughs> thing. They want to win yeah. substantively. Yeah. Competitive people. Yeah. You know, you oh want to be, to be a litigator. Right. right. Hey, there's a question from our audience. Uh, they want to know, uh, are they building a permanent building for the ICA or will you continue to move around the state? Actually, there is a permanent building in Kanawha City down in Charleston. There's the Judicial Center. Mm -hmm. The state actually bought a, a building because they did the numbers, they crunched the numbers, the economics, they were paying rent there. And so the state of West Virginia bought this building and there are a lot of what I call back office functions of the Supreme Court there and the ICA and all of its staff are in this building in, the, in Kanawha City. Now, I think maybe about moving around the state, and this is a... I'm a big fan of the three judges on the ICA. I think they have done an unbelievable job getting this court up and running. But one of the, the brilliant moves I think that they have done is they've set up five satellite courtrooms around the state so that parties, especially think family law, you may not have a lot of money to send a lawyer down to Charleston for an argument. They've set up these remote satellite courtrooms around the state so that no lawyer or no party if the party's not represented by a lawyer, has to travel more than an hour and a half in order to have a hearing before the ICA. Here in the Eastern Panhandle, there's a remote, remote courtroom set up in Morgan County in Berkeley Springs. If we cover this this morning, and I, I missed it, my apologies, uh, but I want to be real clear on one thing. When somebody argues before the ICA, are they arguing before all three judges of the ICA? Yes, every time. And, and are all three, uh, do all three need to be physically present, or is, is some of this conferenced in? All when there is an, a hearing, my understanding, and I've only, I've argued once before, and they were, it was live in front of me. But my understanding is when there is a uh, an oral argument, even if it's from one of the remote courtrooms, all three judges are physically together in the courtroom in Charleston because the camera is on them. Mm -hmm. It's not like you have four screens; they can be anywhere. It's in essence two screens or maybe three if there are two parties arguing remotely, and then the court is together in Charleston. Got it. Now, do you have an opportunity to uh, ask questions back and forth during the course of all this? Oh, absolutely. I can't tell you how many times, and I've been, I argue before the Supreme Court a bunch. I actually have two before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond on May 7th and 8th. Thanks, Fourth Circuit, scheduling out the week before the election. <laughs> uh, and you are prepared, you have an allotted time, like I have 20 minutes in front of the Fourth Circuit. So I'm prepared to give, a, in essence, a 20-minute speech. Mm -hmm. I also have to be prepared 
to, and this has happened to me, where I say, good morning, my name is Michael Schultz. I represent WRNR in this appeal, and I get my first question. And then it's just off and running. It's nothing but question, 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 question. And I never have a chance to really get back to my prepared outline. So it's much different than being a, a, a trial lawyer and in a, in a trial when you go to the appellate level. So because you're interacting with the judges themselves, is that correct? Correct. You, you can at the trial court level, especially mm -hmm. outside of a jury hearing or a jury trial. A lot of times hearings, and I had one the other day where it's just the judge and the lawyers. Sure. And it's back and forth. You're making your argument. It's, it's very similar. Uh, but, of course, a lot, th there's a lot on the stake at the appellate level because somebody has already won, somebody has already lost. And I would think that a, a trial lawyer would be um, much more passionate, and, and especially when there's a jury involved in, in um, trying to present their case. Um, but a judge, if you transition to a judge, has to be much more calm and collected and, and focused on, on the whole uh, trial. So how do you transition from being that passionate person um, to just being the judge and trying to take it all in? Great question. And the one word that I keep coming back to is experience. When I was in law school, I, I had some great professors, law professors, teach me how to do an appellate argument. And you're correct. It is so much different. I mean, there's a whole industry out there of nothing but appellate law, where lawyers do nothing but appellate law because it is so much different than doing trial work. West Virginia, I do both. I do both a lot. And there is a, uh, the experience that I've had is I know what notes to hit at the appellate level versus before a jury at trial. Because juries at trial, I mean, they watch television. Perry Mason, L.A. Law, and, and everything that's on right now. You're going back a few years. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just aged myself, didn't I? Yeah. Hey, I, I knew what the shows were. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. uh, Mike, but it's it's very yeah. emotional and demonstrative because that's what that's what jurors expect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but right. at the appellate level, strip out the emotion. On L.A. Law, who would you be? <laughs> and don't be modest now either. <laughs> who, who, which character on L.A. Law would you be? Uh... uh what was his name? Danny Hamill? Because he had, he had the blonde girlfriend. <laughs> uh, great, great it's about the girl. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, he was a brilliant legal mind. That's why. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Yeah. That, that'll do it. Let me, can I have time for a mechanical question? Uh, so long as it doesn't take too long, because Ron will be calling in in yeah. a minute. Okay. Uh, I got the impression early that you were basically looking through the data from the previous court. Yes. And just the, a data review. But now you're saying that you'll actually hear testimony. Uh, where does the testimony come from? The, the lawyers in the lower court? Uh, or I'm confused with mechanics. Sure. You have a record of what happened yeah. before. You have written briefs from the parties. And as much as I'd like to say that those written briefs are always absolutely crystal clear as to what your argument is and what you're seeking, they're not. And so the appellate courts often will have the lawyers, okay. generally who wrote the briefs to the appellate court, come and, and present their argument. And that gives, a, in the event that the judge has a question on something in the brief, or question from the record, or why didn't this happen, or what did this mean, they have that opportunity to ask the question so that they are cr the judge is crystal clear about both the arguments that are being made because what you want from a judge you want a judge to be fair impartial and balanced to consider your arguments and then have a good reason as to why that judge rules the way the judge rules either for you or against you some of my favorite judges don't always rule my way but i know i get a a fair hearing i know that he or she has considered what i have argued and what i've written and then I get a decision that's a reasoned decision that I can say, yeah, okay, I get it. I didn't win. You saw it this way. I can live with that every sure. day of the week. And every trial lawyer should tell you the same thing. They want fair, impartial judges who, give, who are balanced and who consider your opinion. You get a fair shot in front of. And that's what I would bring to the ICA. Sure. Michael Schultz has been our guest here on the program, a candidate for the Intermediate Court of Appeals. There's uh, one seat that will be available. And there are three candidates for that. And the duration of this seat is how long? Ten years. This is my retirement gig. Ten this years. Is what, that's why I'm saying it's not a stepping stone. 
this is what I want to do. And this is how I want to go out in my career, giving back to the state I love. Michael Schultz, how can people learn more about your campaign for the ICA? Michael Schultz for WV. Dot com. That's M-Y-C-H-A-L-S-C-H-U-L-Z-F-O-R-W-V.com. Good to see you. Thanks so much for stopping by. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys.